you're ready to talk about where most people nowadays, frankly, experience Ubuntu for the first time. Craig, the floor is yours. Awesome. Good morning. Hello. So hi, my name is Craig Lowen. I'm a product manager at Microsoft. And I'm here today to talk to you about why Windows is an awesome place to run a Linux environment, uh, which is a weird, weird talk to give. And my favorite part about giving this talk is the why part at the beginning, um, because it's strange. I work for the Windows operating system. I work on the Windows operating system team. Why am I telling you to use Linux on Windows? And you are all Linux users and Linux enthusiasts. Why would you ever want to use Linux on the Windows operating system? And uh, that's really the goal of today, is to, to show you what that's all about, why we do this on the, the Microsoft team, um, and kind of our goals and, and, and some fun demos. And so specifically, I work on the developers for Windows team. And our goal is to make uh, the Windows operating system as awesome as we can for developers, to make it as fun to use, as interesting to use, and as powerful to use as possible. And I think for some people, you know, the, the image on the screen is li Windows on the left, Linux on the right. And our goal is to bring them together as much as possible to make the Windows subsystem for Linux. So that's why we actually created this. And if you haven't tried out the Windows subsystem for Linux or WSL, um, what that allows you to do is run a full Linux environment directly on the Windows operating system. It's true actual Linux. We have an open source Linux kernel. We run actual Linux binaries provided by the distro maintainers themselves, like Canonical, um, with Ubuntu being our most popular distro. And it is run by millions of users. And yesterday, Mark Shuttleworth, when he introduced this conference, talked about three groups of people who are here. And one of those, the third one, was corporations like Microsoft who are here and, and supporting open source software. And yes, that can be for selfish reasons, um, but I can actually break down for you why we do that. So on my team, the key result that we have every year that we look at is how many users are using the Windows operating system, and that's my department. And on my team specifically, I look at how many people are using Linux workflows on Windows because our goal is to make it as easy as possible to use these different workflows um, on the Windows OS. And where that applies for you is you are either developing open source software for people to use or using it yourself. And if you're developing it, WSL existing improves the reach of what that can go to, to different users. I'll give Moonray as an example. Yesterday, uh, there was an awesome talk by the Moonray team about how they open sourced their uh, ray tracing technology and put it online as open source software. They are an entirely Linux shop. They don't run Windows, um, but that's not the case in the ecosystem. And so when they open sourced, they wanted people to be able to go use it right away. And they didn't want to port directly to Windows because they don't have a need to do that. And that takes a lot of development time. WSL existing allows you, all the users who are in the open source world who per, like using Windows to immediately be able to use that and contribute to your project. So there's already a direct benefit if you're developing software. And then if you're using open source software, um, Microsoft developing and supporting the open source ecosystem benefits you. As well, if you're forced to use a Windows computer, you have Linux available to you as well. So you can try it um, and use Bash as you want. And these are actually, I really only have four slides in this deck because I want to show you a lot of demos today of what that looks like in action. So we're going to hop out of my deck and we're going to go to my desktop. And I have some different demos of cool stuff um, that I want to show you about how you can use WSL and some of the latest innovations that we've done at Microsoft to improve Linux workflows. And so uh, here I have Windows Terminal, I have Ubuntu, and I'm just going to make sure that I'm running Docker. Great, I am. And uh, we can go and run this project. So I'm going to run code, and I'm, I run VS Code. And I can go and open this project up just by running code-insiders. And what you'll notice is even though I'm running this in a Linux context, so I can go to PWD, you can see that this is actual Linux that I'm running. It's all running on the Windows UI and Windows stack. And so the, the ethos of WSL is very apparent of it all feels exactly like the same machine. 
And I'm going to just reopen this inside of a container. And why that is, is because Windows, uh, we work with GitHub. Microsoft works with GitHub a lot. And uh, we have dev container definitions, which allow you to specify a Docker container to, to control your project, to control the state of your project, which I've done here. And it works great for especially difficult projects, which is what we're going to be running today. Um, we're actually going to be running a large language model and image generation locally on this laptop. Um, and so the scenario that I'm going to describe is put yourself in the shoes of a game developer. You want to supercharge your game with AI. And one of the ways that you want to do that is you want to automatically generate character portraits for a character and have it generate multiple portraits in different environments for the same character. So what we're going to do is I'm going to start the, pro the project early because it, it takes a, a while to load these libraries. And uh, we're going to take a look at the code because we're, we're a technical audience. And uh, you can see we're actually loading the Llama 7B model. And so Llama is a large language model that's developed by Meta. And this was actually open sourced in collaboration with Microsoft. So you can go to github.com slash Microsoft slash Llama 2 Onyx, or Llama 2 if you are, um, have more of an American accent. And uh, you can go and download an entire large language model. Uh, large, langu lar large language models, or LLMs, power things like ChatGPT online, um, and they give really intelligent answers to complicated questions. So you can actually download this model and run it locally, uh, which is incredibly powerful. And why that's cool is because these models are run 7B, stands for 7 billion parameters. Usually these run in the cloud because they are so resource intensive. And we're actually going to be running that today locally on this laptop. And so what are we going to ask this incredibly powerful machine? We're going to say, hey, please input an animal that you would like to generate game portraits for. And then we're going to ask it to fill in the blanks. So we will be asking it to play Mad Libs for us. And we're going to say, please fill in the blanks of a, a character that's a certain color, wearing an accessory, doing an action. So standing, sitting, jumping. And the LLM is going to choose that for us. So in this case, we're going to choose an animal. I'm going to pick Pomeranian, because um, they're one of my favorite animals. And we're actually going to start running this on the GPU. And so this is all happening locally on this machine. And it's going to start generating an output for us. So a blue Pomeranian, dot, 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 dot. And while this is running, I actually wanted to stress this machine a little more. And this comes into the second um, point that I made earlier of we integrate with Microsoft. You can get some of the best benefits that Microsoft has uh, while running this as well. Because this machine actually has a neural processing unit on it that's separate to the GPU. So we're running this workflow on the GPU. So a, a blue Pomeranian wearing a sparkly collar, sitting on a fluffy cloud, and panting with excitement, which is pretty cool. And while we're going to be generating the images for that, I am going to go ahead and run an AI workflow on this neural processing unit. So I have a photo of myself. I can go to Studio Effects. And this is a workflow that's detecting my face. And it's automatically panning the camera to look at me. And it's also adjusting my eyes. So right now, I'm looking directly uh, at the screen itself. But it's moving my eyes up towards the camera. All of that work is being done by a neural processing unit on this machine. Um, and so you know, speaking to a Linux audience, that's cool. That's a neat demo that this all works. And I could go use that with Zoom or Teams tomorrow. Uh, I want to go try that out. Like, I want to. This is a Microsoft Surface laptop that was announced recently, which is why it has some cool cutting edge tech in it. You can go try that out, and you wouldn't be abandoning Linux at all. Everything that we're running here today is a Linux workflow that's open source. Um, you can have the freedom to choose and, and use a different operating system while still being able to be super connected with the, the Linux ecosystem. Um, and so at this point in the, in the set up for this uh, demo. It's generated these images, and then it's going to be opening them up for us. And so we're going to be able to see two different images. And where that gets generated is down here. 
uh, we are using Stable Diffusion. And we have asked it, hey, to create a character portrait in both the woods and a city view. And this, this done a pretty good job. Uh, we have a blue Pomeranian dog wearing a sparkly collar. The cloud part, it didn't really get so much, but it is both in the woods and in a city view. Um, and so in this way, you know, this was an example of this is an open source project and one that's the code's available online. All the tools that I've used are open source. And we got a really cool advanced AI workflow happening right here locally on the machine. And last thing I'll point out is you might notice, for those of you with sharp eyes, that this is a uh, GDK tiling up here. And so this is actually a Linux GUI app that is running um, directly on this machine, which is uh, very cool because it even shows up here in my task manager. It's directly integrated with Windows. And again, that's the goal of and the beauty of the Windows subsystem for Linux. All of those work seamlessly together. And so it's, it's actually somewhat difficult to tell that I'm running a Linux app and a Linux workflow here. And that's why we actually put that little penguin tux on the bottom right of those taskbar icons to help you differentiate. Um, I want to show you some other demos as well. And we're going to flip over machines to do that. So this ran locally on this device. Um, what I'm actually going to do is jump to another device. And so one of the other cool things that we do at Microsoft is we have this project called Microsoft DevBox. And so you can run, let me go to devbox.com. Actually, that's more fun. Um, you can go and access a machine anywhere in the world and run the same machine inside of the cloud. So I have a dev box that I actually use when I'm traveling um, to do all of my work. It exists here in the cloud, and all I can do is you know, go connect to it, and then I can go and open this and interact with this wherever I am. And that's cool. Uh, some of you in the audience might go, OK, like, why does that matter for Linux? And uh, the obvious answer there is uh, because it is powered and works, sorry, it works great with the Windows subsystem for Linux. So even though this is an entirely Windows product, it was entirely Windows focused, um, we made sure on the Windows subsystem for Linux team that this whole workflow works great with WSL. And now, as a Linux user, and I do do all, almost all of my development work directly in Linux, um, I can get access to this awesome feature directly. Um, and so I can go use this DevBox tool and, and access this. And it's all supported by my organization, Microsoft. And I can go use these Linux tools uh, wherever I am in the world, which is pretty awesome. And in that, we're going to go and run some other, some other demos. And uh, I wanted to show you some other cool AI stuff um, because Microsoft is doing a lot with AI these days. And our goal is to make sure that that works great with Linux workflows as well. So here I am inside of this dev box. And it is, again, running on the internet. Um, and it is an entirely different machine. You can even see that I'm running a different version of Windows down here. And, um, in this case, we're going to take a look at another project. Um, this is an open source project that's a pet project of mine that I use for, for demos as well. Um, it's called Autotask Calendar. I'll show you what it looks like. So you can go to autotaskcalendar.azurewebsites.net. Uh, and then I'm just going to log in with a test account. And uh, you can go in here, and you have a calendar that just automatically slots in tasks for you. That's it. So very, very simple thing. This is what I actually use to, to schedule my work during the day. So whatever task that I need, I type it in and, and make it work here. And uh, that is open source. And I have the project here. And I'm running it inside of this VS Code um, project here. And let's actually take a look at the source, because we're going to make a live change to it today. Uh, so I can go to github.com. Auto task calendar, and here's where all, all the code is. And um, what I want to show you is some of the ways that the new the, the investments that Microsoft are making can help apply to an actual Linux workflow. So we're going to go ahead and make a change to this website. Um, so all I need to do is go and hit um, Control tilde. 
That's going to open up my terminal. I am running Linux in here, of course, and I'm going to run npm run dev. And so this is going to start up my server. I have a database running locally on this machine. I also have um, the, the website running locally. And I could just go to localhost 8080. I click that, and that opens up in my Microsoft Edge browser on Windows. Um, even though that's running in Linux, everything is automatically forwarded over. And I have my test account. And you'll notice that it looks entirely different than the one I just showed you online because this is a local database. So I'm not going to go mess with production while I'm doing any changes. And speaking of that, let's make some changes. So I have this about page, which is super simple. Um, let's go change it, and let's change it super quickly. So this is the page where I am defining that. It uses view of uh, a web framework, and you can just see the HTML here. And what I want to introduce is GitHub Copilot chat. So I'm using Code Insiders because this is an insider uh, and still somewhat new technology. Um, but it allows you to incredibly quickly code with AI. And so in this case, we're going to describe what kind of change we want to make to the code that I've highlighted. And you can ask it tons of things, like how to fix my code, summarize my code, et cetera. In this case, we're going to say, change this to three columns and include uh, ubuntu.png. I think that's what it was called. Let's make sure. Yep. So ubuntu.png. So I just typed that in. And you can see it, um, it uses a reference here. And so um, my team as well works on uh, tools for bringing AI to developer workflows. And one of the key core aspects of, of Microsoft in doing this is we want to make sure that we're as open and responsible with AI as possible. And part of that is including what reference we show. And so you can see from what I've highlighted, it's showing this is where I referenced it. And if you used Bing Chat, uh, Bing Chat also shows you references of how it gives answers. Why is this important? Because AI uh, can say unpredictable things. And it's really our goal to make it as clear as possible of how we're giving you these answers, et cetera. And you can see that it's actually written this code for me, which is awesome, because I'm just going to hit Enter, <laughs> apply it, save, and we're going to regenerate the website automatically. And it's added this here. So it's able to, to code that immediately for me, um, just from natural language. And actually, I don't like the order of that. Um, so let's, let's change it again. Let's move. Please put the Ubuntu picture on the left and change the text to say, hello, uh, Ubuntu conference in Latvian, for example. And so now we'll rewrite this for us. And we go, OK, that looks awesome. We're just going to slot it in. And uh, there we go. So it's, it's moved over the, the um, Ubuntu image to the left. And it's put in some Latvian text for us on the right. Um, obviously, it's gotten rid of the uh, it's gotten rid of our friend Octocat, uh, which is fine, an unintended consequence. And again, AI is somewhat unpredictable. And I would just need to go back and explain it here and say, hey, please put Octocat back in. You know, I didn't ask you to do that part. And so this part of the talk is, is saying, hey, the, there are tons of investments here that you can take part of and apply directly to your Linux workflow. And then just for completeness sake, let's actually go push this to main, because why not? And so I'm just going to go and commit this. Um, and we're going to call it Ubuntu commit. And we're going to push it right to main. And um, while this is going up to main, we can go take a look at the code for it. And I've hooked this up to a GitHub action. And so all I do is push to main. And it will build my website. It will test it online using an online Linux VM. And then it pushes it onto my Azure website, uh, which is also powered by Linux. And so uh, in this case, when I've run this workflow, uh, it does all my testing, it does all of my hosting, and all of my uh, production is all done in Linux. And so of course, I am testing and running a Linux environment while I'm developing this. Um, and so after about 14 minutes, you'll be able to go online and see these changes as well, which is awesome. 
and without me having to go do anything with the website. So could we have continuous integration and continuous deployment? And with the few amount of time that I have left, I want to show you one more really fun demo um, to this crowd, because this is a demo I, I really can't show anywhere else. Uh, we're going to do some weird stuff with WSL and kind of break the environment a little bit. Um, and so I can go here inside of Linux, and I can go run Nautilus, which is a workflow I'm sure that's familiar to a lot of you. And I can go to other locations on my computer, and I can even go to Mount C. And now I'm in my C drive on Windows, and I can go to a folder, like I have a folder called uh, temp here. Um, here we are. And I can even go and let, let's open my logs folder. I have some, some logs here, like an MSI logs.txt. I can go and open that with a text editor like gedit. And you can see this is um, all running on the, this is a Windows file. So I can actually navigate to where that is um, here on my machine. But I can go and open this entirely within Linux. And so it's as open as possible, right, one way or the other. Um, I can go and access all of my Linux files directly from, from um, I can access my Windows files directly from Linux. So this is the exact same file here that I can open a notepad. But we can also do it the other way around. And let's have, let's have some fun with that because I can go to PowerShell, okay, and I'm gonna go to CD users and clear this. And I can go to lo WSL localhost, and then I can navigate to Ubuntu. And so I can actually go to my Ubuntu root directory from within PowerShell. And from there, I can even run things like start dot, and I can open up Windows File Explorer to, to the Ubuntu location. So I can go to, uh, let's go to home, and I can run start dot, and there we go. So I'm able to open that up. You'll notice this Linux integration here. Um, this is me accessing these files inside of uh, Windows as well, so it's it's open the other way. And then where it gets really fun and, and kind of hilarious is we can do things like TTY here, which will tell me my um, communication to this prompt. It's at dev PTS zero. Okay, so let's go there on Windows and see what happens. So we're gonna go to dev PTS, and then we're gonna run start dot from PowerShell. So now we're looking at the dev folder of our Linux system, and uh, I'm gonna open the TTY0 with Notepad from Windows, and uh, we're gonna see what happens when we save that. And so if I go here and I write hello world, and I save from Notepad, it will actually write to my TTY inside of Linux. And uh, you are the only audience that enjoys this demo, <laughs> by the way. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's my favorite to give. And then while I have just one minute left, I'm actually gonna close off with the slides that I have. Um, and we're, we're gonna chat about basically the uh, architecture in 30 seconds. It's really simple, it's a virtual machine. Um, and we have a virtual machine running, we have a real Linux kernel, the actual distros themselves provide the binaries. And the magic is all done in that arrow in the top in the middle. We have tons and tons of integration to allow GUI apps, GPU integration, file integration, and more. Um, but at the end of the day, we are virtualized with tons um, of added bonuses that we've made to make it all feel like the same machine. And then lastly, what are we working on next? We have performance improvements for networking, memory usage, and disk usage improved enterprise support, and improved tools for managing WSL distributions coming. And if you want to learn more or have any questions, you can reach out to me on Twitter or X um, at Craig A. Lowen. And you can also check out our documentation, install WSL, and the issue repository links on screen. Thank you very much for your time today.